For those who don't know me, my name is Michael Beatty. Uh, I started with Hereford about six months ago. Uh, my role is with breed development. Um, so as you heard John O and Rob Banks spoke earlier regarding the indexes and breed plan and everything else in single step, um, and also with the technologies, you saw the camera work. I've been involved with all the bin work, so collecting all the data, all that carcass information. We've been using Olmtech, who've been supplying that camera technology and uh, capturing all that information. So uh, it's a great opportunity to use the technology and uh, hopefully over time we'll see that in production and it'll be in commercial use. Um, before I forget, we just need to thank our day sponsor, which is Neogen, and also our session sponsor, which is Greater Hamilton and Southern Grampian Shire Council. So, introducing our next speaker is Professor Wayne Pitchford. Wayne is uh, at uh, Adelaide University, University of Adelaide. Um, he's there with uh, genetics and breeding. Uh, Wayne has been the project leader with the uh, Black Baldies project that we've been running for a few years now. Um, we're up to cohort three, and actually next month we'll be killing uh, 270 steers going through that program. So it's, a, it's quite a, a lengthy process and a lot of data to collect, a lot of logistics, but uh, hopefully we're going to get some good information at the end of it. And uh, Wayne's going to give us an update today. Um, so before I start, the, the topic here today is the power of heterosis what has the Black Bawley trial uncovered? So over to you, Wayne. Thanks, Michael, and thanks to Jono for demonstrating how to give the casual version of uh, standing at the podium. So I'm going to uh, follow Jono's uh, lead on that. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, heterosis and uh, Black Baldies. And... Oh, it is changing. OK, I need to just start with some theory. Um, and uh, it's pretty simple theory. Uh, first row of this table, you've got Angus crossed to an Angus. And uh, if you do that, you'd end up with something that would be 100% Angus. That'd be fair? Um, there's no Hereford genes in there. Uh, they have an Angus mum and there's no heterosis. Now, that's uh, reasonably simple theory. Um, if we cross a Hereford to a Hereford, we end up with something that doesn't have Angus, but it's 100% Hereford. Um, it has a Hereford mum, and there's no heterosis. So that's the second line. Um, the third line's actually the important one, because that's actually the primary uh, group of animals that I'm talking about comparing to purebred Angus. And that is, if you cross a Hereford Angus, um, you end up with something which is half Hereford and half Angus. Um, they've got an Angus mum, so there's an Angus maternal effect, um, and there is heterosis present. Now, some people, when they look at a black baldy, they say it's really be good, good because it's half Hereford, and other people say it's really good because it's crossbred, and other people might say it's really good because it had an Angus mum. Well, the reality is we can't separate those out. This is not a formally designed experiment trying to separate out the maternal effects from the Hereford gene effects from the heterosis effects. So what I'm primarily doing in, the pro in this project report is comparing purebred Angus to Hereford side calves that are, that are crossed to Angus. So we're comparing something, in some ways we're not comparing apples with apples, but the point of it from your point of view is there's too many Angus herds and you're trying to sell some bulls into those Angus herds to be able to um, demonstrate, you want to demonstrate that there's value to commercial, commercial breeders of having black baldies. Now, for me, this is a little bit like back to the future. Um, back when I looked more like the person on the left, um, I think I'm becoming looking more and more like the person on the right, but when I looked more like the person on the left, um, I did my PhD on heterosis. And, uh, you know, I finished that in 1992. So um, we've been talking about these things for a long time. And even by then, that was pretty much old news. And uh, I'm going to show you some data um, that was reported from America from 1974. Um, and show that a lot of the results that we actually get um, are as expected and haven't changed that much over time. Um, one of my very rude colleagues suggested that I don't look like either of the people at the front of the photo, but possibly like Biff in the background, for those that actually know the movie. Uh, 
I thought that wasn't good. Um, here's some work from my PhD and uh, what I did at one stage in my PhD was to analyse data on Brahman Hereford crosses that were being worked on uh, in Grafton. And uh, one of the good things about that was they actually had the crossbreds um, compared to the purebreds under different pasture quality treatments. And there was a low pasture quality treatment and a medium and a high pasture quality treatment. And what I found was that when I say, oh, I, I didn't do any work in collecting the data, I just um, analysed the data and got the glory. Um, but what I found was under low quality pasture, heterosis for growth was only 1%. Under medium quality pasture, 13%, and under high quality pasture, 21%. So what that tells me about the mechanism of heterosis is that it's not making the animals more efficient, more biologically efficient. It's just making them having bigger appetites. Like I have a big appetite, if you've ever seen me at a buffet. Um, so they've got bigger appetites so that when the nutrients are available, then you end up with higher growth rates. If the nutrients are not available, then... Um, you don't actually see the heterosis expressed. So when we're looking about comparing Hereford Angus crosses to purebred Angus, they've got some heterosis and part of the reason they're actually growing better is probably just because they ate more. Um, and maybe more economically efficient or more profitable, um, but not necessarily more biologically efficient. Am I standing in the wrong place for you to get a decent photo? <laughs> Okay, um, one of the big things about heterosis is it often has an impact on traits that are um, fitness type traits. And uh, in terms of number of calves weaned, it uh, had a big impact in that trial. And certainly when you cross m more different breeds, you end up with more heterosis. And so in this particular trial, heterosis for number of calves born was 39%. So it's a very, very big uh, effect. Um, so let's move on and look at some of the effects from America. And uh, some of our colleagues at um, United States Department of Agriculture, Meat and Animal Research Centre, so it's USDA Mark, uh, in Nebraska, published in 1974 and then some more in 1985, um, showed a range of traits and the effects of heterosis. Now, I've got a number of tables that look a bit like this, so we're just going to work through this carefully. Um, what I've got is a column for purebreds, a column for crossbreds, and then the difference in a, as a percent. And if you looked at those, num the difference in uh, number conceived first service, we've got the amounts that were there for both purebred and crossbred. And heterosis added about 6%, 6 percent, 6.6 percent for conceived at first service. Um, pregnancy tested in calf, 5 percent. Live calves born, not much of an effect in heifers, but in cows, quite a big effect on um, increasing the number of live calves born. Um, live calf weaned. 6% um, more live cast wean, 1.6% for birth weight, 4.3% for weaning weight. Um, if you actually measured milk production as they did, they measured it in grams per 12 hours uh, at six weeks, so sort of at peak lactation uh, in crossbred cows compared to purebred cows, 7.5% um, improvement in that, and weaning weight per cow joined, 14% improvement in that. One of the traits that's of importance has already come up in a couple of the talks this morning uh, is about marbling and generally there's no real effect of heterosis on marbling and uh, you know there's a range of different ways that it can be measured in America so um, basically they were the same um, and it's so important when you look at my results to see that um, the, the effect on marbling is not a heterosis effect. Um, if, gee those lines are not good on that screen are they? Um, I better move that slide on pretty quick. But the point of this is to show that um, if you compare purebred animals to first cross animals or F1 formula high performance animals, um, the uh, uh, extra 8% in um, weight of calf wean per cow joined um, compared to the purebred. So 8% improvement in the individual being crossbred themselves, but where a lot of the improvement comes is in having a crossbred mum and you get an extra 15% on top of that. That's old American data, still probably holds up pretty well in terms of total breeder herd productivity, 23% um, improvement by having a crossbred calf and a crossbred cow uh, relative to having a completely purebred system. So then uh, more recently in America, um, 
trial run by American Hereford Association on Harris Ranch, uh, which I assume you're very familiar with. Uh, and uh, what were some of the um, results out of that trial? Now, we knew the conclusions from that trial when we designed the trial that I'm about to talk about. Firstly, there's a slight advantage in pre-weaning growth. Uh, morbidity was similar, possibly with a slight advantage for the crossbred, and that's some of my conclusions may uh, be similar to that with just, you know, there's trends rather than real significant things. Feedlot profitability was 30% greater in the crossbreds compared to the purebreds due to a greater feed conversion uh, when they were on feed. Quality grade consistently favoured the Angus. Now, I must point out this trial is like the one I'm going to talk about where it's purebred Angus compared to Hereford Angus crosses. Um, and it's saying the quality grade consistently favoured the purebred um, in a, on average $15 better. Pregnancy rates of heifers improved by 77%. Um, in a relatively short breeding season. Now, the results I'm going to show you from the trial here um, are very, very similar to the historical results and the recent project in America, not surprisingly. Now, the trial that we ran uh, was at a place in uh, north-eastern Tasmania called Muscle Row Bay. Um, when I look at the pastures and the soils, it looks like I'm in southeast South Australia, where I'm, where I'm from. Um, and uh, so sort of leached sands, um, reasonably low fertility country. Um, and an important part about this wind farm is that it's on. It's, le it's leased country under a wind farm. Um, one of the important things about that is it's the, meant to be the most reliable wind farm in Australia. Now, what that tells you about working in the yards or the environment the cattle are in is that it's reasonably harsh. Um, it's just about always windy. Um, one of the things that we get criticised for in running projects on research farms is for running cattle too soft because we have animal ethics committees and we have, you know, all sorts of different requirements. And when we do research on research farms, we're always criticised for not running them in the real world. And if we ran the project in the real world, we would find something different. Uh, let me assure you, this is the real world. Um, when you look at some of the performance of some of the um, values I'm going to put up, you'll see that actually they were run reasonably hard in this system um, and that actually should be viewed as a positive in terms of um, applicability for commercial client systems. Um, in terms of the, uh, the timeline, as Michael said, um, we've got three cohorts. Um, we designed the trial during 2004 and did the first AI in September uh, of 2000, sorry, 2014. Um, and uh, they've carved, they've been weaned, uh, heifers have been joined, we've scanned them for age at puberty, steers have been slaughtered, heifers have carved, um, and then they've carved again as, as second carvers, two natural matings to be able to get a lot of information on them. Here's the time of the forum, here's our three cohorts, and you can see there's still data to come in. So what I'm presenting to you um, is always preliminary data in that we can always look more carefully at it, but there's definitely still data to come in. And on some of the things, we have three cohorts of data, and other bits, we only have two cohorts of data. Um, I need to, at this stage to acknowledge people that are involved from uh, Muscle Row Beef, the, uh, the company that uh, owns the cattle, that company is owned by Greg Bradfield and his family. Um, Raymond Groves is the livestock manager. Um, and uh, Liz Ponting and others within that company have done a huge amount of work. But Liz has certainly mothered up a lot of the calves and done the birth weights and tagging and so forth. Within Herefords, um, you've been privileged to have three CEOs in that time. Um, maybe not ideal. Uh, we worked with John to set the trial up in the first place. He was a very good champion for the trial early on. Um, and uh, Alex was uh, very involved in the trial when, when he was here, and, and then Andrew uh, in multiple roles. Andrew and Hannah and Michael have all done worked on the technical side of it. They've all been fantastic to work with. Um, and a couple of your breed gems who went over and worked up during carving, especially in the first couple of years, so Meg Bill and Victoria Archer, who would be known well to, uh, to most of you. Within the Adelaide Uni Group, uh, we've had a number of people who've worked on it as well. Um, Judith Pitchford's my wife uh, here today. Um, Jenna is in that photo. She's an honours student that did work on the heifers in 2016. 
Um, this is her here. She's vegan. She's covered in tattoos. And she's an excellent gem. Um, and uh, she works in a piggery now, motivated to uh, in try and improve pig survival rates. Uh, she's, uh, you know, really um, uh, quite a gem in terms of her commitment to uh, to working with animals and improving their welfare. And uh, not a rampant activist who's a problem. Um, Jamie Jones is here, and she's going to give part of this talk. She's another honours student. Great privilege to be able to work with uh, with students and to be able to see them develop in the industry. Um, Grew up in the suburbs, didn't know anything about cattle, absolutely loves cattle and loves your industry and great to see people like her coming up. Uh, and then Stephen Lee, Michelle Haber and Rick Turl have also worked on the uh, project. One of the points, before I get too far into the results, one of the points I wanted to make about this project is that it's got links with stacks of other projects. So across the top here we've got New Zealand Beef Progeny Test, New Zealand Maternal Beef her, um, Projects, Another New Zealand Breeding Herds, New Zealand Dairy Beef Project, Angus Australia Sire Benchmarking, Hereford Bin Project, uh, the Black Baldy Project, obviously. Um, this is a slide that was put together by, for another reason. Um, but what the point of this is we've got Angus bulls and Hereford bulls that are used across lots of the different projects. Lots of the progeny are genotyped. Lots of the data will go into breed plan uh, in both countries, in New Zealand and in Australia. And so it contributes to building up that reference population that, um, that uh, Jono and, and Banksy were talking about earlier. So really quite important to have those genetic links between projects. With the genomic data, we're able to look at how are these um, different animals related to each other genomically. It's like uh, when Jono was talking about him and his brothers all got the same parents, supposedly, um, but don't, aren't necessarily the same. And we can see genetic variation based on markers between animals. And what we've got in this graph, it almost looks like two swarm of bees that are going to the right. Um, the black one is the Angus and the red one are the Herefords, uh, Hereford side calves. And uh, in each of those swarms, we've actually got a bit of a tail. And the reason for that tail, and it shows up really nicely with the genomic data, the reason for that tale is that at Muscle Row Beef, they knew there's value in using black baldies, and so some of the purebred Angus cows that were crossed to either Angus or Hereford bulls in the project actually had some Hereford breeding in them. They actually already were usually not black baldies themselves, but progeny of black baldies, so they might have been three-quarter Angus. So some of those black Angus animals already have maybe a quarter or an eighth Hereford in them, and the Hereford animals here that are falling behind uh, the major swarm, um, they uh, might have some extra Hereford breeding in them, more than 50%. So that's what you're seeing there. But it shows, it shows the power of genomics to be able to separate these things out. Okay, so I want to look at some of the results. Firstly, in terms of the calf performance. Um, firstly, I've got the death rate or calf loss, and these are... Um, are in percentages. So of the Angus side calves, now each of the gra of these tables now, I've got Angus side, before I had purebred, now the Angus ones are purebred here, so it's the same sort of column, and then the ones that are the Hereford side are crossbred, and uh, then a difference, and then a significance. And lots of stars means highly significant statistically, um, and uh, if there's no stars, it means not significant, and it, you'll see some others that are borderline. Um, okay, so Angus size, we lost 0.3%. The Hereford side one's 0.5%. It wasn't significantly different. Um, it'd be really bad if I said that that was a difference of 67%, um, but actually that would be a percent of a percent. So I've just taken the absolute difference of that 1.2%. Um, carving assistance score, where one is unassisted, it's a standard breed plan recording for carving ease, my understanding. One is under, unassisted. Um, through to five is a caesarean. Um, somewhere around about three or four is either a four-wheeler pulling the calf out versus a tractor pulling the calf out or something, something on those sort of scores um, that you guys are actually more used to recording than what I am. Um, carving assistance, a difference of 2% between those. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that data uh, in a moment. Birth weight, the Herefords were 8% heavier. 
The Hereford side animals, remember when I say Herefords, I'm actually talking black baldies, uh, the Hereford side. Um, the weaning age difference um, was 4%. That's not, a, not due to a difference in gestation length, but that we used Angus backup bulls. So we used Heref uh, AI bulls for both breeds, plus some Angus backup bulls. And uh, so on average, the Angus were, um, what's that, a difference of eight days younger. And all of the data, birth weight, weaning weight, carcass traits, puberty traits, all of the data that we present from now on is age adjusted. So don't look at it and think, oh, but if they had age adjusted, it'll be okay. It has been age adjusted. Just like what happens in breed plan, and that's the importance of actually using estimated breeding values rather than raw data because all the data has been adjusted properly. Um, so then if we look at weaning weight, which is age adjusted, the Hereford side animals were 4% heavier. Okay, I just wanted to touch down a little bit, drill down a little bit deeper on that calving ease. And there's sort of, if you think about what could start to cause problems, um, people would expect that Hereford bulls may cause more problems than Angus bulls for calving ease. And then you sort of say, well, when's that most likely to occur? Well, if you had the combination of a heifer having a calf versus a mature cow, and if it was a male calf, and if it was a Hereford compared to an Angus male calf, there might be more risk factors that are starting to occur. So let's just look at the data. On the right-hand side, I've got the mature cows, male and female calves, and virtually none of them had to be assisted. There were just one or two Hereford side animals that had to be assisted, but definitely not significant. So in the mature cows, no difference in calving ease at all. If you look at the, I've called them maidens, but they're heifer, heifers that are calving for their first time, so that's why they're maidens for their first time. In the female calves, no difference in calving ease. In the male calves, where, so you've got this extra risk factor, a heifer having a male calf that's then sired by Hereford, you actually start to see slightly higher calving ease um, score, which means slightly more calves had to be assisted when they were males by Hereford from a heifer, which probably is not surprising, eh? Um, then we look at how were these heifers at joining? So they, the heifer calves. So these are not the heifers that I just showed you that had calving difficulties. These are the heifer progeny of those, so the project animals. And I'm comparing the purebred Angus to the Hereford side ones. Um, in terms of weight, they at joining, there's the average weights, around about 300 kilos. Um, difference of 5%, definitely significant. Um, the Hereford ones were taller. Only, a difference of only 2% there is still significant. Um, they were slightly fatter, 8% fatter, or 0.2 mils of P8 fat. Um, and if you look at what percentage of them were pubertal, well, 42 compared to 26% of them going into mating were pubertal. Most of you wouldn't know how many of your heifers are pubertal going into mating. When we first saw this, we thought this was a total disaster. Less than half of your animal's pubertal going into mating. And uh, we thought, you know, this is a, a trait that maybe is major one to be in recording. John has done a lot of work in the north and would show that age at puberty, it genetically, is really highly correlated to maternal productivity of cows later on and is really important for people to be recording. Is that the case in southern Australia? And we're starting to realise that, yes, there's variation in it, but maybe it's not actually that helpful to be recording. That my call at the moment. Um, a really dodgy difference here, 62% is a percent of a percent, so don't actually um, take too much notice of that. The difference is 16%, really. Then we want to know is, well, was that actually important? So you sort of look at that and you say, oh, that's actually good. The Hereford side ones, more of them were pubertal. Well, that's got to be a good thing, which is true. Um, but I want to work through some of the other traits, and then I'll get on to what actually happened to them in terms of their reproductive performance. So at scanning, um, they had grown, which was great. It was always a great to find out they'd grown, wasn't it, Andrew? <laughs> um, difference of 2% there, still significant. 
Um, now, here's an interesting one that came back to a question earlier. Um, you've got a 6% difference in eye muscle area for the Hereford crosses relative to the Angus uh, purebreds. Um, but if you adjust that eye muscle area for the fact that they were bigger, there was then no difference in eye muscle area, which means that the Hereford side ones were a bit bigger because of the heterosis effect probably. The Hereford side ones were a bit bigger, but not actually more muscly, if you like. There was no extra muscle relative to body weight. Does that make sense? Good, I'm getting a few nods. That's encouraging. Um, they uh, had quite a bit higher fat at, 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 as heifers um, and probably, I can't remember exactly, but probably when that was adjusted for weight, that still would have been significant, I think, that 1.2 mils, um, more rib fat and intramuscular fat, no difference at that point. So these are heifers when they were live scanned um, after they'd been joined. Okay, so how did they do in terms of their maternal performance? Um, one of the things that you could be asked of the trial is, why did you run the trial when you pretty much knew the results? And the answer is, A, people wanted to know the results again, and B, we used it to test a whole lot of bulls. So we ran it like a progeny test. We used links with bulls that were involved in other trials, and we recorded other traits like age at puberty um, to try and add to that. So here's our pubertal results. Uh, for the two different ones. I've got red is for the Hereford side ones, black for the Angus side ones. Then when we joined them, we, we, we said, um, well, ha what percentage were joined? Now, there was one group that the heifers really hadn't grown that well, a particularly tough uh, autumn and winter, like many of you have experienced. Um, when we scanned them for whether they were pubertal or not, there was uh, a VAT cohort, um, 10 or 20%, Jamie, that we said, uh, shouldn't be joined, uh, they were too light. So we've actually said, well, what percentage were joined out of the two groups? There's no breed difference in that, um, and it's about 96% were joined. Of those that were joined, how many actually got in calf and, and had a calf? Um, and a bit over 60%, no breed difference. So the fact that there was a difference in their, whether they'd been pubertal or not going into joining, when they'd actually been joined, where they'd suddenly been put with the bull, and that's combined with really, really good pasture. They're joined at exactly the right time for that spring flush of pasture. No difference uh, in their, um, between the breeds in their calving response. And I suspect uh, not as much genetic variation in that time as well. Then when we looked at their second calving, um, the Hereford side ones then had more calves than the Angus side ones. Um, and if we looked at the percentage that actually had two calves, um, there was uh, sort of almost a significant difference. Not quite significant there, but certainly was significant at that second calving. We're only following it in those first two and even getting the data for all cohorts for those is going to be tough. The next question is, of those that then raised a calf, how big were the calves that they raised? Um, and the answer is that the Angus side ones at weaning, their weight, the calves averaged 218 kilos, and the Hereford side ones that weaning, their calves averaged 225 kilos. So there's an advantage of, um, what's that, seven kilo advantage of having a Hereford side mum relative to a purebred Angus mum. Now at this point, I'm gonna hand over to Jamie and she's going to explain to you some of the uh, carcass composition results, which is the focus of her honours project. Alrighty, so as Wayne said, I'm going to go through some of our carcass data that we've got. Um, please keep in mind that we've only got two cohorts of data as our third one's uh, due to be slaughtered next month. So um, it's very preliminary data analysis so far. And the steers were also scanned at a different date to our heifers. So they're older, so that gives them a bit more of a weight gain than you saw with our Wayne's results earlier. So just something to keep in mind when we're going through these results. So what have we found so far? We found that the Hereford side steers are heavier, have larger eye muscle areas, and are fatter than our Angus side steers. When we adjusted the eye muscle area for the scan weight, we once again saw that there was no difference in the eye muscle. So reiterating that there is not a difference in muscularity between our two sire breeds, the Hereford sires are just bigger. Uh, when we adjusted uh, the P8 fat and the rib fat for scan 
scan weight as well. Uh, there was no statistical uh, significance, so uh, not, not important for those ones. Moving on to our carcass traits, um, we saw that there was a, a borderline statistical significance for our slaughter age, with our Hereford side steers being about 10 days older. Um, the backup bulls sort of come into play here. So we've, we have adjusted all our carcass traits to adjust for age. So the, 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 the results you're seeing are not due to them being older sort of thing. So what we found is that the Hereford side steers are 4% heavier and have 4% larger eye muscle area again. But once we adjusted the eye muscle area for the carcass weight, there was no difference. So once again, uh, we've got no difference in muscularity between our two sire breeds. They're just, they're just bigger animals, our Hereford side steers. We had a borderline statistical significance for the P8 fat um, at about 3%, and then rib fat was not significant despite the negative six. Um, with this in mind, uh, without an economic model, it's, it's pretty hard to assess the carcass value um, between the two. Um, but as part of my honours project this year, I will be fitting an economic model using the carcass scanning and the laboratory analysis, which I'll go through in a sec. And this will hopefully determine whether our Angus side steers or our um, pure reds will be less profitable than our Hereford side steers and our black baldies. So um, if you're interested, come back in November and I can hopefully give you <laughs> some results for that one. So in this slide, we've grouped together all our measures of marbling to make it a bit easier. So if we start with our scan IMF, uh, we can see it's si significant with a difference of about 8%. So our hair, uh, Angus side steers are more marbled, so as we expected, so at scanning. Um, moving on to our Ausmeat, which is taken at slaughter, there's actually a difference of 30%. So this larger number is expected due to the smaller, like, the smaller numbers for the Ausmeat. So if we divide 0 0.7 by 1, we're going to get a larger percentage difference than if we have a value of 200 divided by 220. So yeah, so if we move on to MSA marbling, which is taken at the same time as our Ausmeat score, the, the difference is significantly lower, with only about a 12% difference between our Angus and Hereford side steers. And then our laboratory analysis, which is done, um, which samples are taken from slaughter and then analyse later, um, we saw a difference of 29%. So all of these are statistically significant and we can pretty well see that our Angus side steers are marbling a lot better than our Hereford side steers. On a more positive note, there's only a difference in the MSA index of 1%. And our MSA index is the standard national measure of the predicted eating quality and potential merit of a carcass. And so higher scores for the MSA in index correlate to increased tenderness, juiciness, flavour and overall liking of the meat. Um, and this, this results in premiums being awarded along our supply chain. So it's, it's promising that we haven't got as big a difference in our MSA index as we expect. And the MSA index, there are multiple components that go into this, um, but because all our, our steers from both sire breeds are boss taurus with no HDPs and they're all killed at the same date, uh, any of the variation or majority of the variation that we see is dominated by our marbling or intramuscular fat percentages. So we've also um, got some meat quality traits, and so some of these traits are collected at slaughter. So such traits include ossification, fat colour, meat colour and the pH. So our ossification score is a measure of the physiological maturity of the carcass shown through the bone development in the sacral, lumbar and thoracic vertebrae. It is a visual assessment of the degree of calcification present in the cartilage of the vertebrae and a high ossification score indicates that an animal is older. And so there is, in our results we found a small but negligible difference in the ossification scores. Um, so you can see that one. Up there, only 1%, um, which, which we expect because both Angus and si the Angus side steers and the Hereford side steers are about the same age, so they're going to have the same roughly physical maturity. Moving on, our next trait is the fat colour, and we see that it's highly statistical significance with a difference of about 4%. So that's, that's pretty high, and we know that um, increased fat colour is associated with a more yellow appearance, and our yellow appearance is not desirable for our consumers because consumers prefer that wider, brighter fat on their steaks when they're looking in the supermarket. Um, so it's just something to consider when we're moving on. And then we've got our meat colour. 
So meat colour was borderline statistically significant with a difference of about 7% there. Um, it is interesting to note, however, the high, high values for our meat colour for both side steers. So a high value for meat colour is actually so shared with reduced meat quality. Um, so consumers, again, prefer that uh, bright cherry red meat colour, which we get with our lower scores. And then there was no difference in our pH, and they're both within good range, both under that 5.7. So anything above a 5.7 is not MSA graded and is considered to be a dark cutter. So we want to stay under there, which we have, so that's good. Um, next, we have the two, two traits that are measured in the laboratory. And so samples, as I said, are taken from the carcass at slaughter and sent off for further analysis. These were done at UNE for our Black Baldy trial. So our first one is our shear force, and shear force is a measure of the tenderness of a piece of meat. It's obtained by um, working out the force required to shear a piece of meat that was cooked in a water bath at 70 degrees for 35 minutes. About a standard measure requires six samples to be tested per carcass, and then they're averaged to give a more accurate tenderness result. And tenderness is a um, highly valid component in our MSA model and is one of um, is highly valued for our consumer satisfaction and is one of the three highly valued components of the MSA model, the others being our juiciness and flavour. Um, the results for our, our shear force are exactly the same with no difference and no significance. Um, they're both within that desired range, so anything under five is considered as tender by the consumers. So um, pretty good for both sides, no differences in eating quality there. Um, moving on to our cooking loss. Um, cooking loss is, um, is given as a percentage of the shrinkage of a piece of meat. So it's, it's correlated to the juiciness. So lower percentages of cooking loss indicate that more moisture is retained during the cooking process and the meat is going to taste more juicy when the consumers eat it. So these values that we can see for cooking loss are exactly the same again, so no difference. And they're both, 23% uh, is as expected and is within our desired range again. So good, good averages there for those ones. And we've got some graphs. So these, these scatter plots have been included in the presentation to demonstra demonstrate a spread of the raw data. And so these have not yet been adjusted for age. So this is very raw um, to keep in mind. What we've got on this left, left graph here is uh, eye muscle area at carcass at slaughter um, against standard carcass weight. The black dots represent the Angus side steers and the red dots represent the Hereford side steers. What we can see is a large proportion of our red or Hereford side steers in that top, top right corner of the graph, which indicates larger carcass weights, which we expect due to the, the age difference. Um, we can also see the eye muscle air relative to carcass weight. There's no difference between the side breeds. Once again, reiterating that the Hereford side steers are not more muscly than our Angus side steers. It is interesting to note, though, that, the, that there is variation within each breed. And so if we, if we were to draw a line of best fit in that graph and look at a particular carcass weight, we could see that there are dots below and above the line, and there are as many black dots as there are red dots above and below the line. And so above the line means that a steer is more muscly, and below the line means that they are less muscly than our average expected muscularity at that point. And our next graph here shows intramuscular fat percentage at the lab, from the laboratory analysis against the hot standard carcass weight at slaughter. So we see that as Roughly as carcass weight increases, intramuscular fat increases. The relationship is not as strong, though. Uh, we can also see that uh, there is a lot more Angus sides deers in that larger percent of, it, of intramuscular fat, which is what we saw earlier in the graphs, in the tables. It is promising to note that there are a few red dots up here in that high intramuscular fat percentage, and our highest intramuscular fat is actually from a Hereford side steer. So this is a bit of bit of potential for, for breeders to use genetic selection to increase the intramuscular fat in the herd um, to get more profit, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. We thought that should be the, um, uh, the uh, newspaper heading uh, from the uh, results we've just presented, that Hereford side steer her highest intramuscular fat in the trial, um, that one there, uh, if you're trying to present some biased results. Um, 
I just wanted to finish with one more graph um, and it brings it back to the point that I showed right at the start where I was talking about heterosis being, the expression of heterosis being dependent on the nutrient availability. So what I've got in this graph here is um, carcass weight on the vertical axis um, and for progeny either from heifers or mature cows and showing the breed difference. And it shows the Hereford side calves had heavier carcasses than the Angus side calves. But the point of it is that that difference was bigger for those from mature cows than what it was from, uh, from heifers. To me, that demonstrates exactly the point I said at the start, that the greater the nutrient availability, the greater the expression of heterosis that you actually see. So I'll put that in just to show that we're still getting results that um, even when you have a hypothesis about the effects of heterosis, it still backs those up. So in summary, um, we've ended up by using Hereford size over Angus cows relative to Angus, we've ended up with more growth. Um, possibly less live calves, not significant, but certainly if you had um, a big flush of feed at a certain time, the heavier carcass, heavier birth weights of the Hereford side ones, uh, if over heifers especially, um, you know, there's some, some warning signs there about using them over heifers. Definitely less marbling, and that's not a heterosis effect. That's clearly Herefords don't marble as well as Angus. I don't reckon I'm telling you anything new there. Um, better maternal uh, performance, um, and an important point that this data will contribute to accuracy in breed plan, and because all of the calves have been genotyped, um, it contributes to the single step that um, Banksy and Jono have been talking about. So with that, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>